This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. This is a call to order for the um, planning board meeting, November 18th, 2020. It's uh, 632. Um, based on the Governor uh, Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, uh, GLC uh, uh, Chapter 30A, Section 20, and signed Thursday, March 12th, 2020, the planning board meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. My name is Jack Chemsick, and as the chair of the Plan Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting uh, to order at, uh, again, uh, 632. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and is available via Amherst Media live stream. Minutes are being taken as normal. Uh, board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and, and then uh, please place yourselves back on mute. So, Maria Chow? Here. Tom Long? Here. Andrew McDougal? McDougal, McDougal here. McDougal, sorry. <laughs> Doug right. Marshall? Present. And Janet McGowan? Here. Johanna Newman? Present. And myself? Uh, present. So, uh, board members, if technical difficulties arise, we may need to pause temporarily uh, to correct the problem and then continue the meeting. If you do have technical issues, please let Pam know. Discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes will note if this has occurred. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment, I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking members, uh, the member remember to remute, remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period and at other appropriate times during the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during uh, general public comment period. If you wish to make a comment during the public comment period, you must join the meeting via the Zoom teleconferencing link, which is shown on the screen. This link is shown. Um, the link is also listed on the meeting agenda posted on the town website via the calendar listing for this for this meeting. Or you can go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking on the raised hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. So we have our agenda. Um, we've discussed uh, perhaps ending the meeting uh, for a target of 8.30. Um, relatively light scheduled, but with heavy topics that I don't, I think just getting the first introduction through them, it will be you know very helpful for all of us. Um, do we have minutes? No approach. minutes tonight, Mr. Yeah, Dempsey. That's what I thought. So I'd like to open it up for uh, public comment. And do you? I see no hands. No hands up. Okay, that's and fine. Phone calls in. All right. So um, I we have a presentation by a uh, Newman Catholic Center. Uh, their architect, but I did mention for the 40R, we have uh, guests, uh, John Hornick and Rob Croner. I kind of promised them 7 p.m. We would do a go there. So uh, depending on, you know, whether they're, they are there or not, um, let's, I'd, I'd like to stick that 7 p.m. for the 40R discussion so we can maybe swap things around. Okay. So. Uh, I'm moving some people over. Okay. Um, 
So Mr. Shaw. Mark DuPont. Father Gary. <laughs> okay. Were there only three people that you moved over, Pam? Nope, I moved over four. I moved over um, Pinsu, Father Gary, Eileen Cassiari, and Mark DuPont. Thank you. Okay. So this presentation will be under section 3.211 of the zoning bylaw by, how, how do you pronounce your first name? Vinsu. Vinsu Shaw. Yep. Um, from CBT Architects about the new building for the Newman Catholic Center on the UMass campus. So with that, you're welcome to present your, your program. Just give me one moment. I'm going to start my screen share. Hopefully everyone can see this now. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Great. Yes. Or I can see it. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to start with orienting us um, on this. Uh, the star marked on the uh, site plan you see is the existing uh, Newman Center. Across the street from the existing Newman Center is the proposed site for the new building. Um, we're across North Pleasant Street and off of Thatcher Road. Um, I'm going to start with our site plan. Um, so currently the site is a parking lot. Um, we're proposing an L-shaped building along here. This is an existing um, stormwater retention area, which we're proposing to um, make a little bit larger and um, turn it more into a bioswale um, rain garden. Um, with an entry courtyard to the building. Um, we're proposing a new curb cut along Thatcher Road to enter the existing parking lot. Right up against the building will be new parking for uh, the Newman Center and the remaining um, stays uh, the parking lot for UMass Amherst. I'm getting into here's a view of the proposed building from across North Pleasant Street. Um, so if you were kind of standing at the existing Newman Center, this is what you would see. And this is getting closer to our building. Um, we're proposing a brick, uh, white brick masonry for the chapel portion and then a white fiber cement for the student center area with uh, our entryway right around the middle. Getting into the floor plans, um, the program for the Newman Center is fairly similar to the existing building. We have student lounges and hangout spaces towards the left with the main chapel at the right, um, about 400 seats um, for the chapel itself and a cafe in the back with a supporting kitchen in this area. On the second floor, we have the research center, um, a choir loft, which is coplanar to our um, second floor, um, looking over to the chapel and then offices um, to support the Newman Center up here. And then some interior views. This is looking at the chapel, inside the chapel looking towards the altar. Um, we're proposing to bring over the existing stained glass windows from the current Newman Center. Um, that's what you see uh, down around here. And then this is looking back towards the choir loft. And this is the student center in one of the lounges. Um, you can see the 
it's a double height space at the Quigley Lounge and you kind of see inside the Burke Lounge and then upstairs you see the Research Center. And this is upstairs at the Research Center looking back out towards Thatcher Road. And a view of the cafe dining space at the end. That is everything that we have in our slideshow. Thank you. Uh, wh what's the current capacity? Because I know the Newman has uh, an expansion wing there for, for the chapel for, for larger, um, um, you know, masses. Um, so the capacity in the chapel, I, I don't know what the existing capacity is, but the proposed is 400 seats. Yeah, so maybe Father Gary could, I'm just, I'm just wondering in terms of, sure. is this a increase or same or decrease in terms of capacity? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, the present capacity is the same as the one that will be in the chapel now. The, what you're talking about is the side door that we open twice a year, um, which is Christmas Eve and Easter Sunday morning. Um, we, we won't have that in this chapel. Um, we'll have to uh, make other arrangements for any other crowd, whether it's additional masses or something like that, but we won't have an expansion in the, in the new chapel. Okay. Um, so. Jack, I see Chris Westrup's hand is up. Yes, Chris. Um, so I just wanted to say um, thank you to the Newman Center for coming tonight and uh, with their architect. Um, the purpose of this presentation is to inform the planning board about what is uh, going on on the UMass campus. Um, this project is proposed within the educational zoning district and really the only requirement for something um, in the educational zoning district is that um, the, uh, the proponent um, submit plans to the planning board and in this case they're making a presentation to the planning board. Um, the planning board can make comments or recommendations but there's really no permitting role that the planning board has in this uh, project. And if you wanted to read more about the um, ED zoning district, this particular aspect is in 3.211 of the zoning bylaw. Um, and it really just says, you know, what kinds of things are uh, allowed in the ED zoning district. So um, I don't know if anyone has any questions or comments or recommendations, but um, thank you very much for the Newman Center to, to be here tonight. And I see a couple of hands up. Andrew? Thanks, Jack. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I was curious um, from a parking perspective, um, it looked like there were 10, 10 spots um, dedicated to Newman. Do you have an arrangement with the university to use um, their lot for you know, daily masses or at least on the weekend? Well, the weekend is not a problem because uh, as we, have the situation now there's free parking on the weekend so right now people park across the street for masses at this point and they would have the availability to park in the other half of the parking lot that exist that will exist there on um, in back of the building uh, for daily mass we, we've we've talked to the university about this about the possibility of of having a few spaces where uh, i don't know how we're going to work it out but some people that come to daily mass would have an opportunity to park there for that mass time period. All right, and then I just one other quick question was just for the, the cafe is that is that a, a something that will be run by the church or is that something that will be run by the university or a third party? It will be part of UMass dining. Great. That's it for me. Thanks, Jack. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Janet. 
Hey, um, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I know the Newman Center is a very well used building and I've used it myself and I really like the new building. I was worried at first about the facade, but I'm because it just looked kind of like cementy in the pictures. But I do like the idea of the white bricks and having a different material on the other building. The parking seems improved to me because I have, you know, it's it's been parking behind that building and getting into the main building is kind of a ordeal. And I would think some people who had some mobility issues would be really harder. So the parking seems very like an improvement. Um, I have a question just about energy efficiency. If there's any exciting, if it's a zero E building, are there different ways that um, you're reducing energy use or producing energy? If you could add that to it. Thank you, Janet. Sure. Um, we'll have to answer that. Yep. Um, we will be meeting all energy codes and in general, we'll try to use as many energy efficient green uh, materials within our building as possible, but we're not going for any LEED certification or any other energy certification per se. And I will add that the glass, the glass we are using yes. um, will be a high efficiency glass. Um, and, you know, we're really trying to um, limit the amount of, of exposure and we are doing some interior um, uh, treatments and, and utilizing some uh, deep structural members. You can see there's some wood uh, vertical structural elements. Those are glue lamb structures that we're using that will actually provide some glare reduction on the inside of the space. But generally, yes, the, the walls will be pretty well insulated and highly thermal. And you mentioned some stormwater features there that would be, you know, consistent with some lead design as well. So, um, okay, Andrew, your, your hands up, but is that residual? Okay, uh, Johanna, please. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. It's exciting. Um, I know the university is taking sustainability very seriously. I'm just curious whether. I think the Newman Center is an independent entity, right? And so, um, and then I, I don't know enough about the building codes, whether the, do, is it the same codes as the town uses or are there different codes within the educational district? Um, probably this is a question for Chris, um, but I'd love to be educated on it. I think the building codes are the same. I'm not exactly sure who will be inspecting this building when it is um, under construction. The um, UMass has a state inspector that they use for all of their buildings. And it could be that Newman Center and UMass will make some agreement with the state to have um, the state inspector inspect this building. But I believe that all the buildings have to follow the Massachusetts um, State Building Code. That's correct, as follows the, the IBC um, building code. And we, this will be under the purview of the town of Amherst in terms of meeting local zoning codes. But I believe the town of Amherst, ha Amherst has the stretch code because we're a green community. Yes. So I presume this meets that. Okay. Yes, yes. Great. Thank you. And I see no other hands. Uh, Chris, is this something that we open up to public comment? You can open it up to public comment if you want to. Okay. And any any comments from the, the attendees on the public side? Pam, do you see anything? I'm checking. Yeah, I don't see anything. I see none. Great. Well, again, uh, oh, thank you for. One. Oh. One just came up and went yep. back in. Oh, there. Okay. Who? Jack. I, I'm not even going to try to say the last oh, name. Yes. But well, if you hold on. Okay. I will allow to talk. Hello, Jack. Are you there? And now, okay, now I'm unmuted. Um, so Vin Su, and for full disclosure, I'm um, on the building committee for this building. Um, and we just started 
with the building committee. I'm curious a little more of the history. So why not lead certification? I know that Amherst is a green community and you're following the stretch code, but was that a matter of cost? Um, yes, I believe so. Or, I mean, Eileen, you might know more about the history of what that decision was. But well, I, I think, you, you know, we often it. have discussions about, you know, whether we actually go through the certification. I think this would, the way we're designing this building, it would be um, very Able likely lead, be lead certifiable. Um, but I think the diocese wasn't, uh, you know, there was, they were, um, thinking that they may not jump into, you know, actually the expense of the, the full certification that's required. Um, but, you know, we're, we're designing to stretch code, we're designing to, um, you know, pretty stringent Massachusetts energy codes that would, you know, generally meet, um, you know, at least the lower levels of, of lead certification. Okay, so you're practically green, even though you're not necessarily applying for lead certification. That's right. That's right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. And uh, I don't, yeah, so that's it. So I think, um, again, we, we thank you very much, uh, the team, Bensu, Gary, Eileen, and Mark. Um, thank you for having us. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. So um, this is great uh, in terms of being able to seven o'clock here, we can talk about the, the 40R. Um, there's a lot of material here. And I guess, um, you know, we're, we want to revisit this based on the, the revised, you know, you know by all that, that was generated. Um, we have lots of comments on, and Chris, I'm really going to need your help kind of navigating <laughs> through this because there's just been a lot of different, we just got an email from CRC, you know, like an hour ago. I mean, you can't possibly, um, you know, filter through all this and, and digest it. But I just, I, I think it's important because we have three new members uh, that, we hear from everybody in a general sense uh, uh, regarding their opinions on on the proposed 40R downtown. And then we also have uh, John Hornick from the Amherst Housing. Um, well, I'll just call it Amherst Housing Authority for now for short. Uh, and then Rob Crowner, who also sits on, on that committee. Um, and then and we and you know we have a letter from from uh, from Janet that was written and but again we have a new new bylaw that has been provided so um, Chris I'm do you want to give like an overall sort of or or should, uh, presentation on this or do you know how do you think this should go with with John and, and Rob. Well, I didn't really have a presentation pre uh, prepared, but I'm happy to give a brief summary of where we've been and where we are right now. Um, you would you would better you than me, believe okay. me. <laughs> so we've been working on this project since 2018. Um, John Hornick and Rob Crowner were part of the original group, which included um, Nate Malloy and myself. And um, I think the town manager was part of it at one point. And anyway, there were a group of five or six people, including um, the, or in addition to the consultants. The consultants were uh, Karen Sonnenberg of Karen Sonnenberg Consulting Inc. and um, David Eisen of the Abacus Architects Firm. Um, so we had, um, I think it was four public forums starting in um, the spring of 2019. We had one in April, one in June, one in December. And um, over the course of those uh, forums, we learned about what Chapter 40R is, um, why the state wants to promote it. Um, mostly the state wants to promote it for two reasons. One, to build up our housing stock. And they think that this is a 
a good way to build up housing stock. And they also want to increase the number of affordable units um, available to re residents of Massachusetts. So um, we learned all about that, about the background of, of 40R. And then we started to get into the nitty gritties of it. And um, in, I think it was in December of last year, we talked about a location and there were various locations considered. Um, maybe I should back up and give a little talk about what is chapter 40R. Chapter 40R is a state law that al allows cities and towns to, um, to adopt an overlay district in some part of town um, it's usually, um, it's encouraged to be in an area that already has uh, commercial uses, already has transportation. Um, in other words, is already built up to some degree. And there are um, exceptions to that rule. Um, the Northampton uh, Hospital Hill is an exception. They built um, 40R, they are building a 40R in an area that is, that was a little bit derelict. It was an old uh, hospital property that had um, not been used in a long time. And so they, they proposed their 40 yard there to begin with. Then they proposed a second 40 yard downtown. But anyway, it's, a, it's essentially a way of getting more density um, than the underlying zoning would allow. Um, and in um, sort of uh, payback to the town for getting more density, the developer has to provide at least 20% affordable units um, if it's a, a home ownership development and 25% uh, uh, affordable units if it's a if it's a rental development. In addition to that, um, depending on how much uh, increased density um, you have over the underlying zoning, there are opportunities for um, the state to uh, pay um, the city or the town uh, some money. Um, I think it's $3,000 a dwelling unit. And I think it might be each year, but I'm not actually sure of that. Um, and that's based on the differential between what the underlying zoning allows and what the 40R allows. Um, so in, in December, uh, during that public forum, we looked at um, various different locations for the 40R. We might've talked about that uh, previously, but among the locations were um, downtown, in the BG zoning district and the surrounding BL zoning district. Um, East Amherst, which is where the Florence Savings Bank is and the Cumberland Farms and um, Spirit House in that area, that's East Amherst. Um, then we also considered Pomeroy Village. Pomeroy Village is where Mission Cantina is located and there are a lot of little um, commercial establishments there and also um, Ron Laverdier owns a huge piece of property there and the uh, Department of Agriculture has a, has a facility there. Um, so anyway, Pomeroy Village is a kind of, um, we, we, call, we call it a burgeoning village center in that it's, um, it's a, started out as a crossroads, little by little it's gotten built up and it seems like it's on the verge of, you know, something really good happening there. And the other place we looked at was North Amherst North Amherst Village Center um, near the intersection of um, Sunderland Road and Montague Road and um, Meadow Street. So that's um, in the vicinity of Coles Lumber. Um, the old Amherst, North Amherst School is there. The Korean Church is there. And um, recently we've seen the development of the Beacon Communities building a, a large mixed use development up in that neck of the woods. So those were kind of four areas that we looked at. There may have been others that we kind of briefly considered, but um, there, we developed a matrix for why, why choose one over the other. And there were lots of reasons why to choose one or the, over the other. It seemed at that, that time that we were looking at this, that there was some more level of interest on the part of property owners in the downtown area than there were in um, the other locations. Um, Cinda Jones had just recently done a lot of development in North Amherst and we weren't sure what else was um, gonna be happening there. Um, it seemed that the property in Pomeroy Village might be locked up for a little while and there probably wasn't too much that um, was gonna happen at that time. Since then, we've become aware of more development that might be possible there. 
And then the other one was um, East Amherst Village Center. And that's, that's an area that certainly um, could be uh, developed or could have a 40R overlay district on it. So in the end, um, I guess it was the working group based on a lot of information determined that um, we thought the downtown area would be the best place to start. Now that doesn't mean that we can't have 40Rs elsewhere and it doesn't mean that we are definitely going to have a 40R downtown. It's just kind of like we had to choose a place because um, all of the design guidelines and the dimensional regulations and everything else that goes along with a 40R um, has to be kind of rooted in the place where it's being proposed. So we started looking at the, um, at the downtown and the consultants gave a presentation to the planning board in May. I think it was early May, maybe May 6th. And we may have talked about it with the planning board before that, but that was really the time when, when we had a um, presentation. Um, it was a very, um, how can I say this nicely? It was a preliminary presentation. It was not a polished presentation. The, the consultants um, kind of put together the presentation very quickly based on what they had heard from these public forums, but I think they really hadn't you know, gotten a lot of, um, they hadn't really accomplished what they wanted to accomplish. So I think the planning board's initial reaction to it was sort of lukewarm, um, but the planning board wanted to have a further discussion. So they had another discussion in August. I think it was August 17th, if I um, remember correctly. And at that time, it seemed that there was a little more interest on the part of the planning board in um, looking into 40R. And then um, we invited the consultants to give a fourth or to host a fourth public forum. So on I can't even remember what day it was, but I think it was October 14th. Um, they hosted a, another public forum in which at which time they gave a much more polished presentation and they had kind of filled in the gaps of things that they hadn't presented in May. And um, after that presentation, it seemed like there was more interest in pursuing, uh, there was more positive reaction on the part of some planning board members for pursuing this. Not all planning board members felt that way, but some um, expressed interest. And so where we are now is really, um, we're trying to decide, is this something that we want in Amherst? Is this something that we think would be helpful to us in Amherst? Um, would it, um, you know, would it kind of loosen up some of the log jam that we have as far as, you know, what properties can and can't be developed? And so, um, we're looking at the downtown right now, and uh, quite frankly, um, the way the BG zoning district, the central business zoning district is set up, um, there isn't much opportunity in that zoning district to gain um, more density. It's, it's really, um, in terms of, you know, what you can build there, unless we went to six floors. So, um, the real advantage to this would be in the BL zoning district, which is adjacent to BG. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, we'll look at a map later. Maybe, um, actually, maybe Pam could bring up the map now. Mm -hmm. um, and the areas that are colored in yellow, there it is. Do you want this one or do you want the yeah. one that Maria marked up? Oh, the one that Maria marked up would be good. Yeah. yeah. Do you have the original one? Yeah, this is the original one. So there are a little few quirks with this one, but um, thank you, Maria, for that, doing this. That's the original one right there, right? Okay, let's look at that one. Let's look at that one. Let's look at the original one for now. Okay. So essentially the yellow for the most part is the general business district. I think there may be some questions about the land on Kellogg Avenue and whether that's in BG or not. Um, but anyway, the yellow area is the uh, general business district. The green areas for the most part are B or BL, although some parts of them are RG. So it's a little bit um, mixed up here, but the, the area along um, North Pleasant Street between Halleck Street and Coles Lane 
is in the BL. Anyway, I just wanted to point out to you that there are these zoning districts that are kind of attached to the downtown. Maybe this isn't the best map to show it, but they are underutilized right now. They're not um, developed to their fullest potential. For instance, the area north of Triangle Street that's shown here in the green, um, you can see where Cottage Street is noted. That green area is currently a one-story um, shopping area with a huge parking lot behind it. And um, on the other side of Cottage Street is a little building that used to be a Department of Agriculture building. It's currently owned by Cinda Jones and she rents it out as offices. But the point is that that area could be developed um, for housing. Right now it can't be because the zoning um, makes it too difficult to develop it. You need too much lot area per dwelling unit. And that's the same, the same is true of other areas of the BL, which are adjacent to the downtown. So in any event, I guess the long story short is that um, the, the advantage of the 40R to the downtown would be to make it easier to develop residential developments, mixed use developments and residential developments in um, it, areas adjacent to the downtown. Um, what else do I have to say about this? So um, we're gonna look at the proposal for the downtown and kind of go through it and scrutinize it, whether we do that in depth tonight or whether we do that at another um, date is, is sort of up to the planning board. But um, it is true that there are these other areas of town that could be considered for 40 R. So East Amherst is probably the most um, realistic. And um, anyway, um, so that's kind of the background. Where we are right now is we've had four public forums. The planning board has had an opportunity to look at this twice on their own. And now they're taking um, this night to look at it close, more closely. Um, the, the product that you have um, to date is still in draft form. So there's still a chance to make changes to it. And um, what would happen to this is if the planning board decided to move forward with it and pursue it, I think we would take a really close look at exactly, you know, what height do we want? Um, exactly what density do we want? Exactly how close do we want these uh, buildings to be to the road? You know, what, what should the setback be? We, we have done some of that to date, but we haven't really all come to an agreement about um, setbacks and heights and things like that. Um, but the planning board, neither the planning board nor the community resources committee of the uh, town council have said definitively that they want to move ahead with, with this. And moving ahead with this doesn't absolutely mean it's gotta be downtown. It could mean, well, we really like 40R, but we really think it should be in East Amherst. So the conversation is open now and the planning board can decide whether it wants to pursue this and how it wants to pursue this and where it wants to pursue this. And I think the CRC and town council are kind of waiting for the planning board to make a proposal about what they want to do here. So I guess that's all safe for right now. Yeah, and I would add, Chris, that you know the discussion of, of reducing the extent of this 40R in downtown is an option uh, as well. And I'm wondering if it'd be a good time to have John and, and Rob pulled in. Mm -hmm. We can good. do that, right. Jack. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and let me go and find them. Okay. And Mr. Hornick should be on his way. And Rob Mr. Crowner, Crowner as well. They should both be joining you. Great. Mm -hmm. So, uh, John, Rob, um, I'd love to, you know, for you guys to kind of give some perspective here. Uh, Chris kind of did an overview. Again, several forums presented. We have a draft. Um, 
but I, I appreciate, um, you know, maybe starting with John in terms of what the situation we're looking at with, you know, housing in the town and why, you know, 40R is, is something that, the, you know, the town should consider and then why it should consider this downtown uh, proposal as well. Okay, I, I, I guess I'll start out. Um, Rob is certainly much more knowledgeable about these kinds of issues than I am. Um, it may be useful for people to know that this project was initiated actually by the Housing Trust. Um, myself, Rita Farrell, who's a consultant to the Housing Trust, and Nate Beloy combined to write a proposal to mass housing finance, which as Chris suggested, is interested in promoting uh, greater use of 40R throughout the Commonwealth. So we took advantage of that and we uh, wrote a proposal and lo and behold, they funded it. Um, formally, the funding came to the town and has really been uh, primarily the responsibility of the planning department, but I have tried to stay involved with it really throughout and followed what the consultants were doing pretty closely. Um, without saying I support absolutely everything they proposed, I think they did a very good job. And uh, among the things that I really appreciated and frankly that I personally pushed them to do is to include in the proposal a set of design guidelines. We don't have design guidelines down downtown or anywhere in Amherst, as far as I know. And yet uh, people complain, as I do, about some of the newer buildings in town. And the hope is that by having to design guidelines, we would avoid some of the kinds of mistakes that have occurred. Um, the housing trust interest primarily had to do with increasing affordable housing, particularly but housing production in general. Again, as Chris noted, um, in, uh, having a 40 r district means development comes with a requirement that 20% of new units be affordable. And that's significant. Uh, right now, we don't have any requirement for affordability in the downtown area. Other areas of town have, a, uh, a, I think, a. 10% requirement, although I'm not absolutely sure that's a requirement. I think it's only a requirement if there's uh, some kind of special request for a waiver from the existing zoning requirements. So this would at least make it required in the area where the 40R district exists. And it would be great, frankly, if it could be extended to other areas of town as well. As Chris mentioned, the town would receive from the state certain offsets to the costs uh, for some of the units. It would also receive a kind of favored nation or favored town status with respect to uh, MassWorks, which is a state program that uh, supports uh, uh, roads and other kind of infrastructure development in the town. So there are various advantages. Um, we do have a shortage of affordable housing in the town. Uh, the major focus of the Amherst Municipal Housing Trust of which I am chair and Rob is a participant is to encourage the development of more affordable housing in town. Um, if you look at rents in Amherst, they're pretty high, except where they're capped by very specific projects. We're fortunate it looks like the 132 Northampton Road or Amherst Studio Apartment program is gonna go forward. But frankly, that's only 28 units. I won't say it's a drop in the bucket, but it's considerably less than is the estimate of need that was in the housing production plan that was produced now six or seven years ago and in which the town promised 525, I think it was new units uh, we haven't built anything like that number. Um, we did pick up some in North Amherst with the Beacon development, and there have been small numbers picked up elsewhere, but we really aren't 
anywhere toward really resolving the issue of making more housing in Amherst affordable. So this is an important opportunity. And I am personally pleased that the planning board has agreed to take a close look at this. Um, saying that, I know it's going to be difficult. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy about this. People don't like the process. They don't like the details. Um, but uh, I think it's an important opportunity. And if there are things that people don't like, I look forward to hearing the ways in which uh, what's been proposed can be improved. So we do end up with more affordable housing. We have uh, a somewhat denser downtown, which I don't personally view as a liability, as long as the ultimate design for that looks pretty interesting and is consistent with what we would hope for in an old New England town. So I'll conclude with that. If people have questions of me, I'll be glad to try to respond to them um, and give Rob an opportunity to offer his wisdom. Yeah, let, let's have um, Rob um, say some words on, on this. And, you know, former planning board member for how many years? <laughs> but, um, and then we can have, then, then we can ask both of you questions. How's that? Okay. So, um, yeah, so I'm, it's, I'm not just a former planning board member. I was uh, really involved with the zoning subcommittee for all that time that I was on. The Absolutely. Board. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's fine. <laughs> that's the reason that, that's the reason I'm interested in, in this proposal. Um, it's an opportunity, not just for um, expanding the housing stock, and expanding it in in a place where most uh, planning efforts in the last fifty years have have decided have have thought that it should go in in already built up areas. Um, it's it's also an opportunity uh, from a planning perspective to to address what I think and what has long been a, a concern of the planning board about um, fixing the downtown, fixing, fixing those, those uh, zones around the general business zone, the BL zones that don't really work uh, the way I think they're intended or they should be intended. Um, they're, they're supposed to be, if you look at the zoning bylaw, they're called transitional zones. Uh, they're not called buffer zones, they're called transitional zones, but they, can't, they don't really transition because you can't do anything there. You, you have, you're stuck with what is there now because the existing zoning um, does not allow, uh, it, it, the, the setbacks are, are wrong, the, the lot coverage is wrong. You can't, you can't do a new building there. So, so what the 40R proposal does is it, it allows, it um, provides an opportunity for those zones to be built on. Um, it also introduces uh, form-based uh, design standards that, that has also been a long-standing interest of the planning board. And, and of course, um, um, it promotes affordable housing, not just, not just uh, low-income affordable housing, but, but by increasing the housing stock, it increases uh, affordability over, over multiple uh, sectors. So, so it, with, with one um, initiative, one effort, you could address a number of longstanding uh, concerns, uh, issues that the planning board has dealt with, has looked at um, for, for many years. And so I think it's, a, it's an exciting opportunity. So, and, and, and just to, the buildings there would not be able to be built in kind uh, for the for for the lots in the BL, um, some of, some of them would many of them would not be able to be built in kind. Um, yeah. so some of them I think maybe would be. So so the uh, can I just uh, um, clarify? So as as Chris said, um, part of the reason they can't be what that building is not really feasible there is because um, for the most part, most development especially in Amherst, you're going to want to have a housing element. You, you can't just build a, 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 or it's difficult 
to build a, a, just an office building or just a, a retail establishment because it's not cost effective. You need some housing in there. But the, but the housing requirements, according to the zoning bylaw, um, require more lot cover, more, more space, a bigger lot. Um, and you can't, and you just can't fit the right kind of building on on the lots that are down there. So, um, so you could, so some of the buildings that are there, you can keep. You just can't do anything with them, other than what's already there. Mm -hmm. So, um, if we want to add housing, um, we need to we need to fix uh, at least fix the the uh, limited business zones. And and also, I think. Um, the the RG zones. So, so part of the 40R proposes uh, changing some of the RG zones, uh, the general resident zones that that touch uh, BL, and that's also um, an opportunity. So I'd like to open it up to the bat uh, the funding board members for for comment. Uh, but you know, personally, I was struck by the the last presentation in October uh, because since you know, the, the March presentation, this COVID thing has really uh, changed the landscape. Uh, and, and you know, I'm, and I, I feel this housing crisis <laughs> within, within town um, due to personal reasons. My daughter moved out of town because there was nothing available and she moved 45 minutes away. Um, uh, and, you know, affordability issues, you know, came in uh, to play there. Um, but, you know, I was intrigued and I'm wondering, you know, I'm wondering if the, the, the buildings that have been developed recently are more uh, not really necessarily family oriented, but there are some, you know, you know, two bedroom, maybe some three bedroom, but I'm wondering about the family aspect and if the 40R, you know, kind of promotes that. I, Kind of intrigued by Kendrick Park uh, with the playground there. It's just it just seems like we're inviting more, um, you know, amenities for families in the downtown area. So all these things kind of, you know, struck me. So Maria, you, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah. So I I went back. This was great to have you, uh, both you, John and Rob here, because um, I went back to the April 20th proposal and compared it to the November 10th proposal. So I could see exactly where the consultants added stuff and they added quite a bit. And I just want to get a sense from you two, um, you know, the response between the forums was, you know, uh, a lot of neighborhoods came up and it looks like this November draft really responded to bringing the scale down for certain neighborhoods, certain zones. And I wanted your feedback on, you know, um, do you feel like they went sort of, uh, I guess, over, above and beyond as far as responding to um, public comment? Because I know that a lot of people have been saying, you know, the public hasn't been involved or consultants. Uh, you know, the first presentation they did, I felt was kind of boilerplate and had very little that sort of got tweaked for Amherst. But, this latest one, I really found a lot of places where I felt like um, it was tailored to our town. I want your sense on, you know, do you feel like this um, 40 r design guidelines, I don't know if you've had time to review it carefully, but um, whether it feels like it fits a lot better. I mean, already, Rob, you've already made all the points, which are, you know, all the positives we already know, you know, unlocks BL. And unlocks BL brings form-based zoning, brings affordable housing. But as far as like how it really, is designed for our town. Did you guys feel like um, it could have taken more steps for that, or is it um, pretty, you know, pretty well done as is? Um, I just want to get your sense on that sort of um, aspect of it. Rob, um, so I, you're right. The, the, the consultants were really very good. Um, they, they, they created uh, a a sort of a generic proposal. Um, and then they they listened to the feedback and they and they changed it based on feedback. Um, I, I think it is I think it is uh, improved and 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 close to um, close to very good. I think anyone would you know might 
tweak it a little bit. Um, I might tweak it in one direction, you might tweak it in another direction. But overall, I think it's 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 pretty close to, to where we had hoped they would end up. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's never going to be perfect. Nothing is ever going to be perfect. Um, yeah, I would just thank you. say I, I agree with Rob, what Rob just said. I think at every step, the consultants were willing to make changes. I think the process that we devised didn't have enough opportunities for them to listen to people. Um, and that's why, you know, the earlier proposal that you referenced, Maria, wasn't as good as the most recent one. Uh, and it's not like, again, it's gonna be, everybody thinks it's great, but uh, it's really well along. And so there's a real opportunity here, as Rob said, for you all to take your own look at it and think about the changes that would make it really responsive to Amherst to the extent that it isn't already. Thank you. Andrew? Thanks, Jack. Excuse <clears throat> me. Thanks, Rob, John, and Chris for providing the background. Um, I had a couple thoughts and sort of a couple questions here. I know this, the spirit of 40R is, is to add housing, but is it, I guess, is it is it right to also think of it as bringing in sort of this mixed use that we can think of this as a vehicle to, to spur commercial development in addition to adding residential? Yes, it includes mixed use developments. So buildings that are partially commercial and retail and partially housing. And it can also include um, a building that could be all retail and commercial, but you have to have a housing component to the development as a whole. Got it. Yeah. As I think about that, um, you know, what comes in my mind is, and having kind of listened to some of the comments and read, reading some of the comments as well, is just, I want to pursue this in one of the village centers, as, as Chris had mentioned in her introduction, um, almost like to test it out to see if it is something that does seem to be effective, which also allow us to, to to really develop those those village centers in a way that maybe hasn't been done before, and then roll that out downtown. Like, does that does that seem like something that folks might be interested in considering instead? I, I you know, not being part of that original prior, prioritization process, I'm 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 curious how we ended up focusing it on on the downtown, um, almost specifically, knowing that um, we may not be able to add a I guess if it's really only providing benefit in the BL zones, maybe we're not adding that many additional units. What do you all think? Yeah, I would just add that. Um, I think Rob even mentioned, you know, reducing the proposal to a smaller, you know, much smaller area. And that could be a test case as well for downtown. But I, I don't know if Rob and, and John have any comments to Andrews um, I, I I didn't I did not suggest uh, reducing it in the downtown area I, I oh, suggested oh. I suggested um, making it work in the whole proposal by downscaling at the same time introducing 40 r uh, down zoning the existing uh, general business zone so that so that it, it um, it became more attractive to use 40R instead of the underlying zone. But um, but I, I think, so I think the reason that downtown is attractive is because downtown really is, every, everyone knows downtown. Everyone is part of downtown. Everyone, downtown belongs to everyone. And so um, introducing it out there somewhere um, it's that means that you know a, a bunch of the town can, can ignore it. They don't go there. They don't. They won't see it. It, it may. It may still be useful to do it. Um, that may still be a better way of, of going about doing it is trying it somewhere else, um, or it might even work better somewhere else. I personally um, think that East Amherst would be a great place to have a forty-yard zone. 
but but the reason I think that that the downtown was chosen is because that's that's the focus of the town, um, and there are other benefits as as I mentioned earlier. Thank you, Chris. Did you have your hand up? I was telling my daughter to help herself to dinner. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so uh, yeah, Jack, yeah, uh, I, I was. Sorry, yes, I, I was only going to say like that. It, it's just sort of um, my initial read is it, it sort of um, to use a sports analogy. It was kind of like a, a hail mary in, in in the first quarter of like if this is something that could be effective, maybe we should be sort of testing it out in these areas where we might be able to develop village centers. Um, bring in some some needed commercial to support the residential. I think East East Amherst popped to mind, especially of there's a fair amount of housing around there already, but not a ton of um, uh, goods and service like daily needs um, that that are servicing that population. There's mass transit over there, um, and then also I think um, there is just this this general concern given the developments that we've done in downtown of like. We need to make sure however we approach any redevelopment in in downtown is is as perfect as it can be and i just wonder whether it makes sense to build some momentum get some get some excitement maybe do some some great things in other parts of town and then roll it in here because i love the idea uh in principle of this i love the idea of building density the smart growth getting the affordable housing in um and hopefully it's something that we'd be able to to implement across multiple areas before we're done that that's it thank jacks thank you thank you andrew uh janet so um you know the planning board had recommended during the summer um because the crc was wondering what our zoning priorities were or our, um you know not always zoning but just dealing with issues and the planning board had voted that downtown issues were a priority um, including the problems in the dl kind of figuring out more ways to get housing throughout Amherst in a way that, you know, is productive and, you know, fits our community. And then also to focus on the recodification of the bylaw. And so um, this to me, I so, so I see the benefits of the 40 R process in the sense that the consultants work has focused the attentions and we're talking about the downtown problems um, and the need for affordable housing, which I think should be required in all development in housing developments um, and the, and we can see the need to work with the local businesses property owners and community because the more we do that the better the proposal gets and you sort of you get information from people um, and there's a real need and a real desire for people to work together on what the downtown should look like not just in this zone but really everywhere and you know I think the problem with the 40r proposal, which I've identified, you know, a bunch of them. But I think the problem is, is that it doesn't resolve the issues of the downtown in a comprehensive way. Um, and it also doesn't re resolve the issue with, that we need inclusionary zoning throughout Amherst. And um, I appreciate, you know, so we need to do that. I see a lot of problems with this proposal. In a way, it's gotten better because we, some of us have been sort of battering at it, including the neighbors, and sort of saying, you know, we don't want five story buildings across staring at each other and then get things get a little lower. Um, you know, and I can see working on that and working on that and working on that. The question I have for us as a board is, do we want to focus our attention on the downtown issues and problems and work our way through them um, in a comprehensive way to, you know, to get design standards for everything in downtown, not just a building that comes in under the 40R do we want to figure out how to protect our historic buildings, but also increasing density and size? Do we want to um, figure out how to get families downtown? Because having these very expensive apartment buildings are not going to attract families. And um, we'll have like really wealthy people, a lot of wealthy students, and we're going to have, um, fortunately, people will have some affordable housing. Um, and so I, I think, you know, this this proposal doesn't address the parking issue at all. So do we want to focus um, on downtown issues and really chew on them for as long as it takes and, and put some fixes in and some real form based zoning? Do we want to agree about the heights and the design? Or do we want to continue to work on this 40 hour proposal, which realistically only affects a small amount of properties because 
I don't think the property owners are going to bite on most of this district because it lowers heights in the RG. It doesn't do anything for people in the BG. Um, you know, it's, there's just, it, it addresses very little stuff. And it also will just basically wipe out the whole look of most of the town where it is. Do we, do we want to keep on working on this, which leaves most of the downtown problems unresolved, add another overlay district, you know, have a limited amount of affording, affordable units, or do we want to just focus our attentions on the downtown? We have certainly an active group of people. I'd like to bring the business community in because I, I think one of the effects of the 40R and new development is we're going to be losing more small businesses. And so I think we're sort of at a crossroads, like do we want to keep working on the downtown or start a real effort there? Or do we want to work on this 40R proposal, which I think would be very time consuming based on the flaws that I see with it um, that I'm not going to go through. Um, so that's kind of how I feel. And you know, I think everybody knows how strongly I feel for inclusionary zoning. We could get an inclusionary zoning bylaw through the town council very simply. We have two good options on the table right now. Maybe we should put our focus on that and make it comprehensive. You know, I just, to me, just adding a 25 page 40R proposal to our bylaw on top of the overlay districts and this and that, it's like, let's just look at the downtown and resolve it. Let's just have inclusionary zoning throughout Amherst. Let's simplify our situation and really just face our issues head on. So that, you know, that's my vote. Also, I love the idea of the East Amherst thing or, or doing a village center somewhere else, like using a small project and figuring out how it works. Thank you, Janet. Um, uh, John, Rob. Um, I'll just speak briefly. One of the criteria that the consultants urged us to talk about when we were trying to choose where in Amherst was the most likely location for a 40R was whether there were developers ready, willing, and able to do some development. And they did extensive interviews with people around town who own property and who do development. And based on those interviews, their conclusion was downtown was the best opportunity for actual development. Now, there are things that I personally like about East Amherst, but if you look at East Amherst and think about it as a pilot project, what's gonna happen? Well, okay, first you, develop a new 40R draft bylaw for East Amherst. And that takes, who knows, six months, a year. And then it starts to get implemented. And it's probably at least four or five years, probably longer, uh, until you actually see some building happening. So you might be talking about a decade before you see the results of this pilot that you're talking about. By then, everybody on the planning board will be off the planning board. I'll no longer be with the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. And what we've gotten out of it is a small pilot project, which undoubtedly is worth doing, but I don't think it's worth doing instead of focusing on downtown. Yeah, I have to admit, I, bringing this you know, back to the planning board, I, I the, the word crisis kind of <laughs> comes to mind with regard to the, the local economy and our housing and our downtown, all these things. And 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 I agree, John, I, I like the more immediate sort of uh, process that would result from, from the proposal. It, it just struck me as getting action and I think, you know, maybe timing means a lot to this town right now. Um, uh, Tom? Hey, thank you, um, John and Rob, for uh, speaking and for your uh, comments also at the October 14th um, presentations as well. Um, I'm new to the board, as you know, uh, relatively new, and part of what I felt was my duty to try to go back and read as many comments or listen to as much as I could to try to better understand what some of the issues were that were presented um, and sort of what the pushback was against this, and, you know, just trying to understand it from a holistic perspective, what's the problem here. Um, and one of the things that seemed to be problematic was that um, 
there's no guarantee of specific outcomes, right? That it's going to look this way or behave that way. And I think that, you know, as a planning board and as a committee and as, as a community, you know, our job should be to help shape those and foster those outcomes and those changes. But I don't think we can guarantee anything. I don't think we're going to guarantee even with the design review board looking at buildings that it's going to look the way everybody wants it to look and it's going to behave the way everybody wants it to behave. And that, you know, fostering change and growth should be something that we um, aspire to as, as as members of this board. So, um, you know, having having gone through all of those comments and sort of thinking about the w what's been said today, you know, I really do believe that the downtown is the kind of epicenter for Amherst. It represents a lot to a lot of people, um, but it also has a lot of unlocked potential. Um, and I think I'd love to see what happens and this is your pilot i'd love to see what happens when we start unlocking some of those things um and and i could easily see that growing and becoming part of east amherst and other parts of amherst as well um, but i do agree that the immediate potential and the strongest impact is is in our downtown right now and i do think that it's just as much about housing and and jack's concerns and others um, more, more specifically about affordable housing, but also, um, you know, ways to um, bring more opportunities for business owners into downtown and um, build a more robust downtown than we than we have now. Um, so that, that's my perspective on it. So I, I mean, I s support us looking through this. I do agree that if, if we went down Janet's route, that we could come somewhere near this by actually building out a bunch of uh, smaller bylaws to get us to a place where um, we might have something far more specific to what exactly we want. But as an overarching set of principles, um, I support where this is going. I have, I, like um, Jan and I have questions and comments about specific items that um, we can probably debate um, next time. Um, but um, but uh, you know, from my perspective is that uh, I, I support moving this forward and, and look forward to seeing the impact um, in the town. Thank you, Tom. And, and you know, they, we're, we're just we're uh, good point. We're not going to get, you know, in the super details is kind of want to get everybody's, uh, you know, ping everybody here on the board and kind of get, you know, just initial, you know, gut reactions from everybody. And then we can, you know, take this up, you know, the next meeting. So, uh, Johanna, please. Great. Thank you, Jack. And thank you, John and Rob, for your comments. I really appreciate them as well as a new board member. Um, you know, I'll say Amherst, um, one of the things that makes living here so great is that we have really high ideals. Like we want to preserve the historic character of our awesome town. We, I think, as a town support smart growth, we want housing affordability so that everybody who can live in Amherst uh, can afford to live here. We really value our environment. We, you know, want high quality services from our schools to making sure roads are maintained well and sidewalks are maintained well. And we want kind of a vital downtown. And I think those are all values that, you know, kind of make living in Amherst so desirable. Um, and then I think, you know, putting those ideals and those values into practice, like where the rubber hits the road, you know, comes down to things like this. And, um, and I personally think that downtown is the right place to start. It's our core. Um, I really believe in building from the core out, especially when I feel like right now our, our downtown is like on life support. You know, I keep hearing the ads on the radio about the business improvement district, just like saying, hey, SOS, like we are in trouble here. And if we had a more vital downtown with more people living in walking distance to all of the goods and services that are downtown, um, I just think it reflects our ideals. And um, so both because it's our core and it makes sense to invest there first, like just as a principle, I think makes sense. And then secondly, just pragmatically, like, you know, this is close to schools, it's close to the post office, it's close to our shops, it's close to town hall, it's close to bus stops, and it's close to UMass, which is a major employer in town. And so, um, you know, I don't know, I for one think like the, I've been following the parking conversation in our town and, um, you know, 
am happy to be educated more, but right now kind of feel like the parking concerns are overblown. We have enough parking and really what we need to do is make it so that people can live close to town and not need a private car. Um, so I'm really excited about this. I think it aligns with our values. Um, there, I don't think it's perfect, you know, and I think it leaves some things on the table, um, some of which are under, like not under our jurisdiction. So, you know, I would love to see this coupled with infrastructure investments like, you know, dedicated bicycle lanes, for example, or um, really sound stormwater management so that we're not like building new parking lots that also just, you know, put polluted water into the Fearing Brook, which pollutes the Fort River. Um, but ultimately, I'm a firm believer that you accomplish big visions kind of step by step. And um, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I think that this is a real opportunity to move forward now, not two years from now, not five years from now. And I'm excited about continuing to explore this and make it the right, you know, make it kind of as Maria said, the, the best option for Amherst. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna. That was uh, very good comments. Uh, Doug? Yeah, um, I guess some, some of what I'll say is a repeat of the written comments that I made back in May. Uh, I guess um, I, I'm generally supportive of the massing that is proposed in this uh, set of uh, proposals. Um, frankly, I, I probably would have opposed some of the downsizing that's happened in the last few months. Um, because I'm, I'm generally uh, in favor of greater mass and greater density downtown so that we can have a critical mass of people that live, work, buy their groceries, and can commute without private vehicles. And uh, I agree that UMass is the dominant employer and the ability to, to walk there uh, or bicycle there easily uh, makes downtown and everything between downtown and UMass uh, prime, prime real estate. Um, so um, I, I guess my, you know, I, I agree that it's not perfect from my point of view. Um, I kind of disagree with Chris that we have a log jam downtown um because uh i think the thing that slowed down sort of the next big building project between kendrick park or kendrick place and one east pleasant uh was the coronavirus uh uh and not that you know i mean we certainly heard that there was a big project planned in that area where the where the where the pub restaurant was um and i don't think it stopped because of our zoning i think it stopped because of uncertainty about economic conditions and what's gonna be the population of UMass in the next few years. Um, so I agree with John that, that there are developers ready to do work downtown. Um, I guess my, yeah, my biggest concern is that I view Kendrick Park as Amherst's Boston Garden, the public garden and um, so if I put my take off my architect hat and put on my developer hat, I want to allow the highest and best use in what I consider potentially the premier real estate precinct in Amherst. And so to sort of artificially say you've got to put 20% affordable units in that area feels to me like we're giving up potential revenue from you know, retirees who want to have an urban experience in a small town now that they've fled from Manhattan uh, from the pandemic. Um, it just feels to me like we're uh, limiting the potential income, uh, frankly, from the from that area. Uh, so, you know, I wouldn't down I wouldn't down zone any of the BG. I probably wouldn't do a 40R in any of the BG, but I fully support doing it in the BL zones that are proposed here. Um, and um, I guess, uh, let's see, what else? I, I, I think East Amherst would be a, a fine alternative. Um, I will throw out that I think University Drive 
uh, would be another place that, um, you know, we could allow a lot of housing down there, let people walk to the big Y and take the bus down University Drive to work. And there aren't a whole lot of abutters there who would object. So similar to how a lot of uh, old large cities have a, their downtown and then they have a secondary sort of uh, exurb uh, commercial district a few miles out of town that's newer and nicer. Well, maybe University Drive could be our, you know, the modern downtown. And then we let the quaint New England historical village downtown from back when we were a town of 5,000 people uh, stay up, up on the top of the hill. But, uh, you know, if, if the consensus is that we want to move forward with the, the downtown zone, that's fine. I'll come along for the ride. Um, I guess, uh, you know, in terms of having people talk about timing and this being a crisis, um, from my point of view, this is a crisis that is probably 50 years in the making because th this town really hasn't allowed significant housing uh, since the 70s when UMass attained pretty close to its current size. So, uh, you know, we kind of have, we've, we've made the bed we're sleeping in um, and it's going to take a while to, to dig out of it. That's I'm all writing, I'll, that's all I'm I'll writing, say for now. I'm writing multiple notes, Doug, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. That, that, we were getting tons of great comments. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we've heard from everyone. Janet has her hand up again. Um, so Janet, please. So um, I just wanted to just, uh, just to present a little background is that in the last like 10 years, we've had, you know, and things that are under like Greenleaves Apartments has been adding housing Amherst Commons was, you know, I'm not sure if it's, it's, I think they still have a permit. We issued a permit, Spring Street, we got a permit, One East Pleasant Street, Kendrick Place, Main Street, LLC. Amherst Hotel is building, University Drive South is under, underway. University Drive was just built. The presidential apartments increased their housing. North Square was a huge jump ahead. There's not like a lack of housing being built in Amherst. And so, if you have this impression that like all you know downtown has to be unlocked because we just are all you know it's like there's a tremendous amount of building that has gone on for housing units in Amherst. Um, also, the same ten years, UMass has added four thousand students, but not four thousand beds. Um, and so I think a lot of the issues. So that's been going on too. And so I think that so let's you know there's and I don't think anything we do tonight is going to affect COVID. And I think there's just no, the timeline doesn't work. And so I think we have to make good decisions based on long range kind of visions and plans. I think downtown could use a lot more densification. I think it could use much nicer looking buildings. I think it, you know, I, I have so many, you know, you know, we have a master plan that talks about that. I think if we want to keep going with this 40R proposal, I think before we decide to jump in, I think we should compare, do a comparison chart and just so we can visualize what we're talking about numerically, let's do a chart where we compare the BL, you know, the heights, the dimensions, the possible units, to the to the um, BG, to the changes to the 40R, and also add, you know, what if we change the BL to Business Village Center, which allows a lot more housing, has sort of less setbacks, but also preserves the three stories, um, and then add a little thing about you know, if we required 10% or 12% or whatever of inclusionary zoning throughout all the districts, how many units would we get versus this 40R, which is really going to be a very small part of downtown. So, you know, where's our biggest gains? But also, I think we need to chart comparing one strategy for the other. Like, if we're going to say 40R is our strategy downtown, we're going to put all our chips there, but we're not going to address other issues in downtown for a long time. Let's know what what we're, what, why we chose that over something else. Um, this is not particularly my suggestion. It's um, also one, one of the things have how many units can we put in? 
you know, so where, where will the gains be comparing the BG to the RG district and things like that. I think this is not my idea. It's actually Pam Rooney's idea, who's um, used to be on the planning board of just like, let's just take this, look at this very systematically and say, okay, where, you know, let's compare one strategy to the other, pros and cons, numerical differences, how many units, IZ benefits, and just figure out what we're, what we're proposing to enter into. Because if we take one path, we're kind of like not taking other paths. And so I think I'd like to like for as a next step suggest at like a more systematic look. I do think this this piece of legislation needs a lot of work. And so I think before we embark on it, let's let's figure out if this is the best strategy to get what our goals are, which would be more inclusionary zoning, more density, I think better looking buildings, um, and things like that. Jack, Thank Chris you. Prestrup has her hand up. Chris? I, I just wanted to point out that if the planning board does decide to pursue the 40R, that doesn't mean that we can't make changes to the BL and the downtown and the RG. Um, it's just, uh, it's, there are two, really two different types of development. And one thing I've been hearing is that um, the 40R may be more suitable to larger developers and um, it's got a lot of complications associated with it. Um, not, not insurmountable complications, but just a lot of, um, you know, the state being involved and having to follow certain types of rules and regulations. And that may not be um, appealing to some of our local developers. Um, local developers may be more interested in, you know, kind of traditional types of development and so, you know, to Janet's point, I think that, you know, she's made a lot of good points with regard to um, the need to change the underlying zoning in the downtown. So all I'm saying to you is, if you choose to go the 40R route and pursue 40R, it doesn't mean that you wouldn't also want to make changes to the underlying zoning, because there may be two different groups of developers who would go after one versus the other. And I think it is important to make um, the BL buildable, developable, whether or not people ever take advantage of 40R or whether or not the town ever adopts it. So I just wanted to say that it's more work. Obviously, it's more work for the planning staff. It's more work for the planning department. It's more work for town council to try to understand it all. But I think it's really um, necessary to make changes to the underlying zoning of downtown and the BL and the adjacent RG. So that's all I wanted to say. Yeah. So um, I, I'd like to hear from from John and Rob. Maybe these might be, you know, closing, you know, statements. And um, may I just make a point that um, there are a couple of attendees with their um, hands up. So um, before or after John or Rob speak, maybe you want to hear from one or two attendees. What What do you think now for? Public I think comment. It's probably, probably good to do it now. And then, okay. Yep. Okay. And For Pam. Sure. Yes, I see. Um, I thought everybody would go to the top. Yeah, I see Ira, Pam, there Joyce, we go. and Ken. Yeah, Pam Rooney, Joyce Berkman, Ken Rosenthal, um, Ira Brick. Yeah. Ira, Ira is first. Okay. Ira. Thank you, everybody, and I appreciate the discussion that you're having. Um, I am just one person that lives in Amherst, uh, and I've been describing for a while the town that I would love to see as the end result, which would be downtown with a lot of three-story buildings. It's an appropriate height. If you look at buildings that are already downtown that are the most attractive, that are the most cornerstone buildings, they are typically three buildings, three stories with uh, uh, some service or product on the main floor and then offices or condos above. And I only say that to make the point of, it sounds like nobody on the planning board really understands the pill that 40R is that you are deciding whether to swallow or not. 
Chris Restrup, who I respect a lot, mentioned six story buildings maybe would be needed to achieve the density. There's so many people in this town that hate five stories and don't want four stories. I just think that when you ask what's the worst thing that could happen by going with 40R, it's basically whatever you permit that you don't like. And I would just say the way to go is to prescribe the end result, as Stephen Covey says, begin with the end in mind and then figure out if 40R is that solution. And I also want to add, for several years, I had an office in South Amherst and Pomeroy area, and that's a very dangerous intersection. I was told that people have been killed crossing the street there, very poor uh, traffic control, and that what they need is that mass... Um, Mass Works, I think it's called, but Mass Works will not be given by the state unless they see trends and forces of an area. For instance, if they knew that that Pomeroy area was about to get something like a 40R, they would go ahead with it. And that's why somebody mentioned, I think, Chris, that the state would smile on uh, Mass Works being approved for an area like that. And I don't know that we know what's happening with the UMass population. A few years ago, a chancellor, I don't know if it's the current one or not, said that the college population is going to be declining. At the same time, there's been a big movement of put dorms on campus. If you put dorms on campus that are attractive and livable and affordable, there might not be six to eight uh, students in a student house. And if you lowered that to three, then families would be able to afford houses and you've solved the affordability crisis in this town and the housing crisis in a totally different way by recognizing that we have a major state university in a small town. Just another point I wanna make is, I think that people are going to do whatever you permit them to do. And the last session that I was on where somebody was saying, um, look at this facade and look how we described all the design elements to try to get the next tall building in town to be handsomer than the ones that are here. And everybody was like, this drawing is as ugly as any of those buildings that have already been built. And he was saying, no, that building is not the actual look of the building. It just indicates what all the design elements are that we would be mandating. In other words, that architect was saying you could build the same ugly kind of building with the new design elements. So I think that you really need to be careful to make sure that you're prescribing the right factors, the right limitations. If 40R is a powerful pill that's really gonna do something, make sure it's gonna do what you want it to do because it could also blow the head right off our town. So I don't hear enough understanding by the planning board about what 40R is and could do for you to responsibly say, let's swallow that pill. Thank you. All right, uh, Pam, Pam Rooney. Yes. Hi everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think I I second the thanks for the conversation. I think it's really great that everybody is starting to actually get into the nuts and bolts of this uh, proposal. Um, I think I would just back up and say, um, I, I would like the planning board to really consider if 40R is the tool that you're looking for. And I think we, uh, Janet mentioned, we had a short conversation about uh, the various tools in the toolbox. Um, and my perspective is let's look at a comparison of the tools we have and identify which are the, the most appropriate ones to solve which problems. So that's kind of my, my basis. Um, I have a couple of questions and that is, um, was there uh, or is there in fact a, uh, an initiative underway uh, that addresses the area of the pub um, Cousins Market, that, that general zone? I would be very interested to know what is currently even being thought about. Uh, and, and you can answer that after I finish talking. Um, the, the 40R final draft, um, I will, I have to say that 
people have lauded the, the consultants, I would say they did a very minimal job and it was only because they got such feedback and pushback that they actually cleaned it up and actually looked at Amherst and said, oh, you're right, there are some nuances here that we were not considering in detail. And, and then they threw them into the, the final product that we just saw. So, so I'm, not, not, I'm not giving them an A for this job. Um, the, the conversation about uh, limited business, I've heard at least six of you say, uh, yes, we really need to unlock the BL. And at some point in this conversation or follow up, I would actually like to hear what each of you means by unlock the BL. What do you envision the lower part of Cottage Street should look like as opposed to what it currently is? Um, the, the two areas in town that, that are, I would say, most uh, applicable for this 40R conversation is literally the BL on Triangle and Cottage Street, as well as the Henyon block. And I would say, um, as, as somebody who does home construction projects, I try not to start painting at the front door. I learn how to paint and make my mistakes by the back door. And I work my way around to the front door where we will live with the mistakes that we made for a hundred years. Um, somebody acknowledged, I don't know, in some conversation recently that in fact, they, they really didn't realize the impact of the, the zero setback, front setbacks when um, I think it was one East Pleasant Street was approved. And I thought to myself, the people who are approving the bylaws ought to be able to visualize the impacts of what they are approving. And I think that's a really critical element in this, um, in this plan. It's very difficult for some people to visualize what five stories at the edge of the sidewalk actually means. And we're talking, we're talking up against sidewalks, not uh, not 20 feet back from the sidewalks. So I think we're, we're talking about, about a Stores Connecticut look, which is kind of a contrived downtown as opposed to the very organic, kind of messy downtown Amherst, which could have greater density with um, adaptive reuse, infill behind buildings where you keep your kind of funky streetscape, but you build some density behind. Um, I don't know in all of this conversation how many units are actually going to be afforded if we're talking about the one BL district on Lower Cottage Street and maybe the Henyon block. How many, how many apartments are we actually getting and how many of those are actually affordable? Um, let's see, what else? <laughs> That's about it. That's about we it. have we have several more hands there. Yep. You're you're. Uh, I didn't say that three minute limit, but uh, I you know you obviously have a it? lot of points. <laughs> Did I exceed it? Sorry. No, um, thank, thank you. you, thank you, Jack. May I say something? I just yes. wanted to say that um, this is an initial conversation for the planning board to have, so it's not really a public hearing. Um, so and and we have a limited amount of time tonight. I just wanted to let people know that there'd be plenty more opportunities to talk about this. And um, as I said, this is an initial conversation. And I know you had said you wanted to end the uh, meeting by 8.30. I, I'm not yes, exactly. and, 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 and so I'll be a strict, you know, for the three minutes now for, we have uh, uh, Joyce, Ken, Jean, and Ted. So Joyce Berkman, so three minutes, Joyce, you're yeah, on, okay, there you go. Am I audible? Good, yes. thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I appreciate the uh, conversation as well. I find myself uh, somewhat confused by some of the remarks, but that I won't take time to talk about. What I do wanna suggest, and going back to Janet McGowan and the idea of a comprehensive and more general look, a vision of the Amherst that you would like to see. And in talking about that vision, I think if you don't think of housing stock as your first 
point of departure, but think about business. And what I'm talking about is imagine having places in Amherst that genuinely attract families for business. That is the businesses attract families. When I first came here, there was Louis downtown, a major grocery store that was kind of the fulcrum of the town of Amherst. What if we really had a bowling alley again? What if we had a pet store? What if we had really an outstanding concert or performance, let's say a performance area like they've recently built in Northampton where students and residents and people could come and do poetry readings or put on one act plays or do some ensemble work. Areas that genuinely would bring people into town for food, for uh, culture, for families to enjoy the town. Then there won't be a business crisis in town, which right now is just a plethora of restaurants and cafes. And with a few exceptions, I mean, obviously we can't under COVID use our cinema, which is wonderful, but we can't do that right now. But I'm looking ahead beyond COVID. And what your vision is for the kind of attractions that the town needs to have so that families and students don't just go to bars and restaurants. And at the same time, I'm hearing a little bit about, and it's not just a little bit, there's a lot of talk on campus about a decline based on the plunging numbers of 18 years olds in our state and generally. It wouldn't surprise me if at some point Southwest or any number of these places would be converted into general apartment buildings for people to live and take buses into town or to walk on campus to do enjoy various activities. So let's not assume that there is a housing crisis or a housing shortage. Let's wait and see on that. I'd say within the next 10 years, we'll have a much better sense of population parameters in the town of Amherst. Um, the pandemic has possibly revolutionized the way people are gonna talk about towns. And while Doug, something really appealed to me and you're saying an urban experience in a small town, I think that's incompatible. If we right. have an urban experience in a small town, we have a city. And many of us who envision Amherst think of ourselves as living in a town, not in a city. And we have ample urban experience. We have plenty of places to go to if we have new places oh, to go to. Hey, okay, thank three you. minutes up. Thank, thank you, Jack, you. for watching and, and, the clock. Yes. I appreciate it. All right. So yeah, you know, we're getting a lot of comments here. Uh, Ken Rosenthal, please. And uh, again, uh, three minutes if you could. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I want to speak quickly about process and substance. Process is, um, I want to thank Chris Restrup for her efforts a while ago to try to make it possible for a group of us to get together to talk about these issues in a more expansive way. I hope you will have read the letters that, the letter that Pam Rooney and I and a couple of others wrote, published in the Amherst Bolton a week ago talking about the inadequacy of meetings like the one we're having tonight, where your uh, audience is unable to see each other. You can't see us, you can only hear us. Yet you make this opportunity available to people like John and Rob, I think that's great. They have a chance to have a cross dialogue with you, but the rest of us are limited to three minutes. And I think you're gonna cut me off in about a minute and a half. So uh, I'm looking forward to not just uh, other meetings, but opportunities where you and your your constituents can participate in these very important issues. I, for instance, am a former chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals and was a member of the Select Committee on Goals for Amherst when we came up with the notion about village centers. And so there's a lot of history here that I think you need to take advantage of. One bit of history I'll mention now, and then I'll shut up, is that the town used to be full of people living in, of families living in buildings in the existing buildings we have right now. Those second and third and fourth floors where there are four stories uh, used to be apartments not offices and that's why a louis food where cvs now is that's why a louis food could sustain itself for a while because there were people who could walk there and would want to walk there it was a full service supermarket that was perfect for amherst now we have 47 restaurants and bars that have pushed out of town the stores where people used to shop the reason i think that housing is important and the reason i think that we are going to need want housing in town is because uh, this pandemic is teaching us how many of us can work from home. And small towns like Amherst, especially towns as 
qualified as Amherst are, are, are the destination homes for people who are moving out of the cities, moving out of Boston, moving out of New York and working where they wanna live. And this is a great opportunity for us. I think we need to take advantage of it and talk about it. Thank you for the time. I look forward to being, having time to talk to you at greater length about all these issues. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, uh, Jean? Hello, this is Jeannie Hardy. Jeannie, sorry. You can hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Well, thank you for the opportunity to comment on this. I really want to second the opinions that question the need for a 40R in the limited business district. I question it on two accounts. The first is, it's not clear to me that the amount of affordable housing that we'll get from 40R is really going to make a difference to the people who it is suggested to serve. Uh, it's, a, it's a tiny amount of affordable housing. I feel if we want affordable housing downtown, let's build affordable housing. But let's not do this 40R in the, in the name of affordable housing when it's only 10% of the units. My second, my second concern is about um, turning the limited business district into uh, the 40 r district because we've seen again and again that buildings in the general business district reached their maximum height with no setbacks and or very few setbacks and so i agree that this new this final version from the architects looks a little bit better but it still doesn't guarantee that the limited business district will have any transition to the neighbor neighbors who surround that district and one of the planning board members commented that there's not a problem with parking we should just encourage people to take public transit i think that's a wonderful idea i live close to town we're a family of four with one car so that we can take public transit but most people don't make these decisions so living where i do what a half a block from the limited business district there is a dearth of parking and come and take advantage of it there isn't parking particularly if we densify the business the limited business district as a 40r with multi five and I guess maybe six story buildings. So I would really, really like the planning board to carefully consider whether we need a 40R in this area. Why can't we keep things as we, as we have them and uh, on a case by case basis, assess whether developments will be in line with our vision for Amherst. I don't think we need the overlay of the 40R. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, and we have Ted. Hello, this is Ted. Hi, Ted. Welcome. So, uh, very quickly, I just want, to, I appreciate what uh, Janet was saying about the need to sort of look at the whole picture. Um, and not just focus on one space. I second all the comments that came before me and um, just you know, the demographics are going to be changing. And I particularly liked the idea of start at the end, figure out what you want. Uh, I think 40R could be a tool that you don't necessarily need. Um, so that's all I have to say, thank you very much. Thanks, Ted. So um, I, at this time, I'd like, you know, Rob and, and John kind of closing statements, and then I think we can wrap up. I don't know that um, we need to make a recommendation uh, today, but we can kind of digest this. Um, I know CRC is speaking uh, or have discussed the, the, 40 said the exact opposite thing last time um somebody isn't muted who should yeah. be yeah i think all of everyone um
There you go. Can I get them all? Yeah. So, um, but I, um, John, Rob, with with uh, what the planning board comments and, and some of the public comments, you have any, Rob? Yeah, I, I have two points to make uh, in response to what I've heard. Um, first of all, most people are making very good points. I mean, I, 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 I don't disagree with most of what has been said in, 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 in criticism of it. Um, I still think it's, it's worth pursuing. So my two points are one, um, not liking the, the, the existing buildings or the new buildings is not a reason to avoid 40R because the existing zoning allowed and allows those buildings. So if you don't like those buildings, you have to change the zoning. Um, and second, um, in in uh, the 40R that covers the BL, most of the most of the BL, um, the the buildings would be, would be limited to three stories, which is what Mr. Brick and 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 some other people have said is what they want. So three three stories, which is actually the, what is allowed there now, said it can't be built because of of other. Uh, zoning problems. So three stories is, is still um, the proposal for for the limited business zone. Thank you, Rob and John. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk this evening. Um, unlike the other people, I don't think you should be careful. Uh, I think you should just charge ahead and do something irrespective of what the potential consequences might be. No, seriously, I do appreciate the fact that you've got a smart, experienced planning board. Uh, I think everybody on this board has their own ideas, and the issue really is how to synthesize them. And if that means changes to the 40R proposal, that's fine. If it means you walk away from the 40R but do something downtown that fits your vision, that's fine too. I just don't think that you should leave it alone. I think that there are opportunities here and we do want to encourage more development. And I do think that also has to support downtown businesses as well as additional people living downtown. But if you have additional people living downtown as others have pointed out, it means there's going to be more support for business. So thank you. Thank you, John. So I'm wondering, uh, do we would we um, have a roll call on, you know, further discussion, or would we, you know, are we in the position of making a decision like we don't want to talk about this anymore, um, and that it's more of a straw poll, I guess. But again, from from a time perspective, I don't want to, you know, force anybody's, you know, to to make a, a rash decision here. <laughs> Um, but Chris, maybe you can help me out on, on what we can do. I think you could make a motion that, um, you want to pursue talking about this 40 R proposal and then see how many people, um, go along with that. And then that will give you a sense of whether we want to keep putting this on an agenda for the future. Okay. So do I hear a motion to that effect? Almost. Okay, Tom, a second. I'll second, Johanna. All right, Johanna. Uh, don't think we need a discussion, but any any words? Okay, so I'll just do a roll call. Uh, Maria, do you want to? All right. So the motion is we want to continue discussing 40R. That okay. there's merit here. There's something. Yes. Worth doing. Okay, so. Uh, Tom. Yes. Andrew. Aye. And Doug. Aye. And Janet. Um. I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say don't talk about it. So. Okay. Let's get some. You know. Is that a yay or a nay or? Kind of like an ah. Ah, <laughs> I need to record it though. So. Yes, I, I think we should keep talking about it, but I, I do want to, 
if we're going to keep talking about it, really dig into it in the details and the the sections and the lack of there's too many waivers. Like I think people have to plummet into it because I think that's when that's where the problems really emerge. But I, I'm I'm not in favor of this proposal in downtown. So, but I'm not going to tell the board not to talk about it. it seems, so I'll say yes. Okay, Johanna. Hi. And I am a yes. But I think that's unanimous. That's good. Um, but so, oh boy, we're at, we're at eight thirty here. Um, but thank. Uh, I want to thank Rob, John. You guys, you know, appreciate all the work you do on on the housing trust. Um, and I'm so glad. And I apologize about the last meeting. <laughs> Where a uh, little little mismanaged there, but I, I'm so glad you guys were able to uh, be present and and help us with this uh, discussion. Thanks. Good luck. Thank you. Um, okay, so the next on the agenda, um, but I'm I'm Chris. Here I go, leaning on you again. Um, we have old business. Is this? There was the, a revised. Uh, pardon me. There was a revised agenda, and I, yes. uh, I don't have the copy of it, but I think I can read. I it. have it. It's it's uh, Janet's proposal for revisiting. Um, the, um, the, um, the Emily Dickinson Museum. Yes. Yeah. So what so, about Janet to make her statement, and then. I have a, a statement that I'd like to make. Okay, so let's just do that then. I, I was just worried about uh, Bruce, if he's in the attendees. Um, yeah, he's there. So, right here. so let's, let's, uh, let's uh, broach this subject that has been uh, uh, presented to us by Janet. Okay. So, um, I, we had, I abstained from the vote um, on the Emily Dickinson permit because I was unsure about, and I think the planning board was unsure about what section, the language of section 11.2417's meaning was with respect to lighting. And so at that meeting, or we discussed three questions. Does all the lighting have to be downcast except for the architectural and interior lit signs? Um, does all lighting have to be turned off after business hours, except for safety and security lights? And then are nonprofits, iconic or historic buildings exempt from the section's requirements? And, Excuse me, um, I think that you're, um, you're going over into a discussion of the topic and not focusing on um, whether or not you wanna reopen the public hearing. So I think you should read your statement that you sent to the board and um, have the board discuss whether they want to reopen it. You can't give your arguments outside of a public hearing. So I was just giving the background to my research. So, I mean, so. Okay, well, um, be careful. Yeah, I just, I mean, it just seems like I'm trying to set the scene because it's just super random. So I researched the legislative history and I wound up looking at the warrant article and the town meeting discussion and vote um, which took place on November 28th, 2007. And, you know, I, I, you know, in my memo, I've had the legislative history um, and the statements by um, um, the planning board member, um, Jonathan O'Keefe. And so I think that legislative history states very clearly that all the exterior lights should be downcast all the lights should be extinguished outside normal business hours, except for safety and, and security lights. Mm -hmm. And all the, the section applies to all uses in all districts with, and there's no exemptions or waivers. There's no language on that. Um, so that was why, so I think to me, you know, I'm an attorney, but also just a member of the town. I think it's very important that the planning board apply our rules very, you know, correctly, fairly and consistently um, you know, if, it, if things are applied to everybody, it tells applicants what they have to do, and it tells the public that... And the, you're uh, going into your arguments, yeah. just yeah. ask them whether they want to open the public hearing or not. So, and you can't, you can't make your arguments tonight because the public hearing isn't open, the public isn't aware of what you're talking about, and the applicant isn't here. So anyway, so I, so the question for me was, 
Um, does the board want to reopen the hearing and possibly change the permit conditions, revote, or vote to continue the hearing to allow the applicant to make adjustments? Um, and then I also have a question for Chris is, do we have to reopen the hearing just to revote? Yes, you do. You okay. absolutely have to reopen the public hearing. Yep. So I, 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 do you want me to read the memo or has everybody read the memo? Or would that help? You can read the memo if Jack says it's okay. Yeah, sure. I'm acting like the chair here. I don't want to read the whole memo, but I, I want to do I, it. Yeah, I apologize, Chris. I, I, I'm, um, it, it, it's just, I don't know in, in my four years that we've had this situation of revisiting a decision that's been made by the board. And, um, but I understand the hearing mm -hmm. needs to have, you know, the, the parties here that, and public, you know, has to be advertised and, and all that. So right. Janet, you have a clear uh, request um, simply based on your research, whether you want to reopen uh, the hearing or not. So uh, is and, was it helpful to read the Jonathan O'Keefe's testimony or has everybody read that already? So I don't want to waste time. You probably don't need to read it if everybody's read the memo already. Okay. I sent an email this afternoon and I would like to read portions of that email. Um, Chris, so please. The board closed the public hearing on the Emily Dickinson Museum on November 4th after more than two hours of presentation and discussion over two separate nights. Section 11.2417 was thoroughly discussed before the board made its decision. No members of the public or abutters spoke in opposition to the application. The board voted six to zero to one with Ms. McGowan abstaining to approve the application. Ms. McGowan is asking to reopen the public hearing in order to present arguments about why the information about the legislative history of section 11.2417 is relevant to the Emily Dickinson Museum case. She would like to present reasons why the board might wish to change its decision based on this legislative history. Hearing Ms. McGowan's argument and discussing whether to change the decision is only possible in a reopened public hearing. No information can be taken in after the public hearing is closed unless the board reopens the public hearing. In my opinion, any decision to reopen a public hearing must be made very carefully and done only when absolutely necessary. A difference in interpretation or application of certain provisions of the bylaw is expected to occur at times and does not rise to the level of requiring to open the public hearing to reopen the public hearing where the, when an issue was already reasonably discussed. Applicants come to the board and go through the public hearing process expecting to get a decision that they can have confidence in. They do not expect the decision to be reconsidered at a later date. I recommend against reopening the public hearing, but I would also say that at a later date, the board may wish to revisit the language of section 11.2417 and decide if it needs to be clarified or improved as part of the zoning bylaw rewrite that's currently underway. So that's my statement. Thank you. Okay, uh, before uh, seek public comment, oh, get my right screen up here. Um, my my opinion, be, because uh, I reviewed some of this, I really didn't think that, that the research that Janet came across uh, rose to a level of, of actually new information. Uh, there, there was some rationale that was spoken, in, in my opinion, um, what she presented, but that was really based on abutters, uh, residential abutters. And uh, I think we thoroughly um, uh, discussed this again, much longer than I, I thought we would because I had someone else scheduled. Um, uh, it, it was the 40 hour discussion and we went, we, we went another hour on it. So, um, so I agree, I agree with Chris, uh, Doug. Yeah, having uh, had Janet essentially make her request that we open the public hearing and having heard Chris's uh, statement, I guess I would like to move that we close discussion and vote on whether to open the public hearing, whether to reopen a public hearing or not. I hear a second. 
Second. Tom, Tom or Maria? One. Give it to Tom. Um, any discussion? Further discussion? Okay, we can do a roll call. All right, do we want to uh, reopen uh, the Emily Dickinson Museum? Chris, help me here. Uh, the, uh, the motion was move that we close the discussion and that we vote on whether to reopen. So you have to vote on whether you're gonna reopen. Or no, you have to vote on whether you're gonna uh, vote. And then after that, you take a second vote to decide whether you're gonna reopen or not. That's what I understood Mr. Marshall to say. I'm actually confused. I'm confused. I, Mr. Marshall, um, I don't think he was asking you to take a vote on whether to reopen or not. He was asking you to take a vote on move like, that we all, close all the, the question and vote on whether, well, I don't know, maybe he better rephrase it. <laughs> yes. Doug. Okay, okay, sorry for the lack of clarity. Uh, I'm uh, moving that we we all vote first to close the discussion. And secondly, that we vote on whether to reopen the public hearing. I don't so, think I've, I don't think I've actually made the motion to reopen the hearing. Did I? Just to get really technical. Uh, what are you proposing then? Well, I, I mean, I'm <laughs> proposing that we vote on whether to open the public hearing. So I'm making the motion. Okay. 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 <laughs> All right. But I'd like also to have us vote to close the discussion. Does so you should do that first. Yeah. Move to close the discussion. Right. Are you so, moving to close the discussion, Doug? We do the, two motions one to disclose and then one can be much more clear about whether you're going to um, ask to reopen or not. Does anyone yes. else want to discuss this? Okay. It's my understanding we need to discuss this in the public hearing if we decide right. to hold it. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so we really can't say much. So I, there was a second, Tom, to, to close the discussion, I do roll call real quick. Maria? Yes. Tom? Yes. Andrew? Aye. Doug? Aye. Janet? We're voting to stop discussing? Yes. Okay, sure. Uh, Johanna? Aye. And myself, yes. Okay, and now we deal with a second motion, which I'm not sure has a, uh, a second when whether we would reopen the public hearing. So I think that needs a second. Um, Tom. Wait a minute. Okay. Let's get the wording of this correct. Is um, Mr. Marshall making a motion to reopen the public hearing or is he making a motion not to reopen the public hearing? Doug. Well, since those are the choices you've given me. <laughs> well, isn't this my motion? You can, uh, let, Janet, you can make, let Janet make the motion. Yeah, why don't we, why don't we do that? I do feel okay. a little stepped on here. Um, I would like to move to reopen the Emily Dickinson hearing to consider and consider the new the legislative history. Okay, so that will need a second. Thank you. Oh, okay. And any further discussion? I see. Oh, uh, well, Doug, is that a residual hand? Yeah. Okay. So we'll do a roll call. Um, so an A or is in favor of reopening this? And um, uh, Maria? No. Tom? No. Andrew? Nay. Doug? Nay. Janet? Yes. And Johanna? No. And I'm a no as well. So I think that closes uh, that issue. 
And topics not reasonably anticipated 40 hours prior to the meeting? No topics. Okay. So new business, we have Bruce Carson's letter. And again, we're, we're past what our target was, 8.30. Um, I don't, I think we'll be okay, but let's bring Bruce in. And. Oops, where'd it go? He's there, his hand is up. Yep. Hi, what? Bruce? Bruce, yes. are you? Can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So thank you for your your uh, your letter uh, to us. And if you, you know, I maybe I'd give you a few minutes here uh, to summarize. And then yes. we can we can just, you know, discuss. I, uh, I'm not sure what, you know, I think it's just more of a, I, I'm not even sure we need to act on this because we're, we're really just getting your information. Uh, Chris is, what's your understanding in terms of the, any decisions being made or this is more like a public comment basically, isn't it? It's to understand the problem that Mr. Carson is bringing to your attention and then you can decide if it's going to be um, one of the items that you wish to address during the rewriting of the zoning bylaw. Okay, so we would make a recommendation, basically. I think so, yeah. All right. So thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Well, thank you for your time. Uh, we have a situation in our neighborhood in which the lack of a definition of what is a resident manager has come up. <clears throat> we have a um, absentee landlord who has a small home rented to three students and he has proposed to convert the garage into two more bedrooms and under the current zoning for this district he would either have to be owner occupied or have a resident manager he doesn't he is not going to be occupying either residence so he has proposed um, finding a resident manager among these six renters and it seems to me and to my neighbors that this is an untenable situation uh, these are probably going to be six students five or six students and how can one of them be a resident manager who is expected to monitor the others and their behavior and also maintain the property properly and it, it seems to me that something could be done in the future with the zoning bylaw to more clearly define what what is a resident manager? Is it somebody who should be a professional person who either works for a, a rental agency who has previously been a resident manager of an apartment complex? Um, also, it seems to us that a resident manager should have his or her own unit so that there can be an objectivity in managing other people and in managing the property. To be living amongst friends or roommates, it just doesn't seem to us to be a workable situation. And I think this original zoning bylaw was intended for older people who might need additional income to stay in Amherst to create a second unit on their property, but they would be the owner occupant. And now it seems like absentee landlords could use this as a sort of loophole to create a situation in which there, there really is an adequate supervision going on. It, it seems like it's not the intent to us, to, to the neighbors and I, that this is what a resident manager should be, is a, a, a student monitoring other students who lives among the students. Thank you, Bruce. Um... Thank you. So I, I I suspect that this is going to be a discussion. I mean, this this uh, hit some kind of trigger points for me with regard to the whole, you know, availability of housing. You know, family. You know, housing for families within uh, the town. And 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 it, Bruce 
your letter, I, I, I end up like doing some research, uh, which I think I will present um, at a, you know, a subsequent meeting that I think, Chris, you shared an email that I had. It had to do with incentives for, you know, own your occupied, um, uh, you know, uh, properties versus, you know, having some incentive. Because my understanding is there's there's a lot of freedom for a property owner, and uh, and Bruce is seeing this as a uh, pushing to the edge of what might be, you know, reasonable. And it's it's I think it's I think it's a tough one to to legislate and 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 monitor. Um, so, Jack, Mr. McDougal has his hand raised. Andrew, please. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, I'll be very quick. It's just uh, Bruce. Thanks for bringing this to our attention. I'm I'm surprised that it is only now coming to our attention. It seems like something that would have come up in the past. And I, I do think that it's worth worthy of having future discussion to clarify. Yes, uh, thank you. And I, I'm, I'm thinking that tonight is not, uh, not the best night uh, for it, but I would like to talk about this situation and so where we can make a, an intelligent recommendation to the to the CRC and town council uh, on this particular issue uh, and Rob Moore uh, as we do the zoning bylaw uh, rewrite because it, it, it appears to be a whole Doug yeah uh, I also would support uh, talking about this in a later meeting um, I think uh, it would be helpful to me in that later conversation if Chris or Rob Mora could give us some uh, information on the performance standards that we expect from uh, rent, you know, from landlords uh, with the operation of their property, whether they are in resident or whether they have a resident uh, manager. Uh, because I think, you know, I don't really care whether the manager lives with other people or not, but I expect the same management performance, regardless of who's managing. Thank you, Doug. And do I have do you see any other discussion? Good. So uh, we can make uh, someone make a motion that we can discuss this as as a you know, old business topic in in, a, in the you know next or future meeting. And and I would probably wrap in some some of the things I put in that email about you know recommending tax incentives um, that some towns in Massachusetts have have been using for uh, you know quite a while. You know where owner occupied buildings get a rebate basically um it's not our purview exactly but it's <laughs> it 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 uh, i just i feel like we need to provide some incentives for owner occupied you know buildings versus you know the rental situations but so Chuck, mr marshall has his hand raised and janet has just okay. raised your hand Doug, do you have a continuation or? Well, you were looking for a motion to talk about this at a later meeting, yes. and I thought I'd give you that. Oh, perfect. Thank you. All right. So moved. <laughs> um, Janet? I'll second. Oh, great. Thank you. That actually um, resembles my hand. Any discussion? OK, we'll do a quick roll call that will continue this discussion because it's merits. Jack, I think uh, Janet wanted to discuss. Oh, OK. Sorry. Oh, sorry, Janet. Um, let me, OK, just a quick comment is that I, I, I don't, Jack, about your comment about the owner occupancy and the tax um, break. I, I, the planning board isn't limited just to zoning issues. And so we're not a zoning board. And um, so I would encourage you to talk about that in other meetings. OK. It's more, you know, we have a more holistic mission and um, I would just, I think that kind of thinking really is helpful. So. 
Yeah, I mean, we would be making a recommendation to town council, I guess, about some incentives. Um, so thank you for that. Um, does this require roll call? Mm -hmm. that, yeah, the okay. motion and a All second. Right. So, so this will be the, the uh, so the vote is that we'll continue this discussion on the general concept of owner occupied and management of non occupied non owner occupied. Um, uh, properties in Amherst. So, Maria? Yes. And Tom? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Doug? Aye. Janet? Yes. Uh, Johanna? Yes. And myself, yes. Okay, so, and Bruce, thank you so much. That really was timely. Um, former planning board member, um, appreciate that thank you and thank you all for your service thank you all right so briefly uh we can move to the second topic of new business which is the master plan <laughs> implementation which we pre-meeting we talked about what 350 rows on the on the excel table so mm -hmm. uh <laughs> that's impressive that is impressive so, so do you want me to just say a few words about it you or, or Doug? We don't need to talk about it a lot tonight, but Doug and I spent, I'm gonna guess six hours working on this um, master plan implementation table. And it was actually pretty um, informative to me, even though a lot of the information came out of my head, but it was informative in the sense that it showed me how much we've actually done. And um, you know, there are many things left to be done and many things that are started but not completed but it was pretty impressive to think about all the things that we have accomplished. And so um, this is really just a first draft and I haven't um, gone over it. I Doug typed things that I was saying as I was saying them. So I haven't had a chance to go back and read it and I'm sure I'll wanna make edits, but you all might want to add things or make edits too. So if you wanna look at it in its raw form now or not tonight, but you know, over the next few weeks, then um, we can come back and discuss it more fully at a future date. But I wanted you to see the fruits of our labors. And thank you very much, Doug, for spending that time with me. Thank you, Doug. Um, thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chris and Doug. Um, I'm within the master plan. Um, I haven't looked at the raw, you know, the actual master plan. Was there like a template in there of this form? Yes. Okay. It's part of but, the master plan. I think it's a, Appendix A. Okay. All right. So I'll have to take a look at that. Um, so Johanna has her hand up. Yes, Johanna, please. I was just going to say that I, um, when we first embarked on this, I was like, this seems like busy work, but I actually think there was some uh, real value in getting the data dump out of Chris's head and onto paper so that we can all internalize it and then share it with our community. <laughs> Um, so kudos to Doug and to G and to Chris for just advancing the ball. I think it's really exciting. Grateful for your work. Can I also say that we should uh, also thank Pam for uh, coordinating our multiple oh. work sessions, in, 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 especially in light of some technological challenges <laughs> along the way. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, for me, it's like this committee, what, uh, you know, this was mentioned in the master plan way back when, and it just never rose to the level of this organization that now we're kind of rallying around, you know, thanks to, to uh, you know, uh, this planning board, uh, Doug and, and Chris. So I appreciate that. And I, seems like that's really getting behind our charge of what we should be doing. So. Um, topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours prior to the meeting for new business. Um, I have a topic. Yes. Um, I've recently been made aware that um, the dispensation that we were given by the governor back in the spring, having to do with deadlines, is going to lapse on December 1st. So. I have three planning board decisions that, well, actually four, 
that need to be signed and filed with the town clerk by December 1st. And I'm gonna make a plea to you. Um, the new members don't need to sign, but the former members do need to sign. And I'm also gonna round up Christine Gray Mullen and David Levenstein. Um, we need to sign the Amherst Media decision. And I'm very embarrassed to say that um, I haven't completed Russ Wilson's decision for uh, porch on Vista Terrace, nor have I completed the decision for the Kendrick Park playground. And that's um, now under contract. So those three decisions have to be signed and filed with the town clerk by December 1st, which is the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. So I'm gonna be making a plea to you in the next few days and I'm hoping that you'll be in town and I'll be able to drive over to your homes and get you to sign these decisions. Chris, can we get some pies from you? I'll, I'll give you whatever you need. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, no, don't, don't throw anything else at Chris. Leave, everybody leave Chris alone for the next few days and uh, let her get these things done. Yeah. Um, Mr. So, Marshall uh, has his hand up. Well, Doug. I was just waiting to, <laughs> oh, Jack, do you want to call on me? I did. I oh, did. Good. Yes. Um, Chris, I was just going to ask if you could have all three at once. I certainly will. Okay. Yes. And I'll I'll work with you. I'm sorry I haven't responded up till now. <laughs> well, hopefully they'll be written by the end of the day tomorrow. So one of them is two of them are written. The other two aren't. So mm. I'll get them together and then I'll get in touch with you. Great. Uh, form A in our subdivision applications? No, none of them. Okay. None. Upcoming ZBA applications? Yes, there is yeah. one. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Let me share the screen really quick because. Where is it? Here it is. Oops. Sorry. Oh. Oh my lordy. I think I'm tired. So here it is. I'm gonna take it out of the screen share. So there's a race um, coming before the ZBA for property at 33 Pine Street. So to request a special permit to modify a previously approved special permit in order to remove a condition that requires the permit to expire when there's a change of ownership um, and instead replace it with a new condition that requires the new owner to submit a new management plan and compliant response plan to the ZBA for review. Um, oh, 338 Pine Street. So I made an error there at the top. So it's located at 338 Pine Street. That's all there Great. is. Thank you. You're um, welcome. <laughs> Uh, upcoming SPP, SPR, uh, SUB applications? None that I know of. None. Okay. So uh, regarding uh, planning board committee and liaison reports, um, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, I, I, the last you know meeting was what October eighth. I never really summarized it. Tonight's not the <laughs> night to summarize it, but I, I do want to say that there was uh, a presentation on the economic impacts of COVID nineteen uh, in the Pioneer Valley that really struck me, and it and it and it really had some implications on you know downtown areas and and what it means and it was it was fascinating i i'm and i'm going to try to get the the slide presentation for that it was by uh, uh doug hall who's the data manager and analyst i think he's a he's an amherst uh amherst uh, resident as a matter of fact a uh, new hire at pioneer valley planning commission um 
but you know, there's an executive committee uh, committee meeting tomorrow. Um, but yeah, if I can, you know, if I can get these slide presentations, I can we can just share them, so I don't have to try to, you know, recreate them. But there, it's some informative stuff. So, um, Andrew, I know you had a meeting uh, this week. Yeah, uh, meeting again tomorrow. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, we have heard all the presentations. So for CPAC, we've heard the, all of the presentations. We'll be discussing and voting on those tomorrow. Um, that that discussion is likely to span multiple meetings, but we do have that. Uh, some good news that we learned in last week's session was that um, the state match uh, increased pretty significantly, uh, which gives us an extra uh, approximately $300,000 um to use towards projects so that was really great news wow good news uh the, the there was a discussion was was the uh was it e street housing discussed uh by presented by john hornick yeah yeah, yeah. he did uh, so um we're still waiting some information waiting on some information from john he is uh, they're, they've got a proposal in for some, some money which would be used to acquire property, which they were actively negotiating. So um, they were not able to share details um, mm -hmm. relative to exactly what that ask would be given the timing of, of their conversations and, and the negotiation with the prospective seller. But it sounds like those conversations have, have produced, uh, have gone um, very well to date. So uh, that's looking to be one for us to, uh, to consider. Thank you, uh, Doug. Uh, any any news? The ad commission. Well, I think I saw an email from Chris with Paul's permission for me to go to their meetings. I think it's though, a little even, even though I haven't been appointed, I wasn't quite sure what to make of that. <laughs> I think what he was saying in the in the memo or in the email was essentially that the planning board has nominated you as their representative. So you can go and attend the meetings as a non-voting representative. And then Paul will inform the town council that this is occurring. And I don't think that either of them has a role in appointing you. So I, I think I was misinformed. Okay, so-, so Paul will be uh, informing the town council that you will be the planning board's representative to the Ag Commission. And so now we have to get you in touch with the Ag Commission. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Design Review Board, Tom. Yeah, we had a follow-up meeting. Um, last time I think I mentioned we uh, approved some um, bus stations downtown or bus stops or shelters downtown. Um, they're pretty much in line with the designs that are there now, pretty much mocking the same ones on three locations. Um, and then there was a review of um, essentially the installation of a somewhat interactive wayfinding system. There'd be three units um, on several corners. I can actually share a plan. Uh, maybe I can have uh, Pam circulate that and Chris circulate it as well. Um, three locations where they're putting up wayfinding um, utilizing funds from uh, COVID support um, to basically try to get information out into the town about um, what's going on with COVID to support local businesses and advertisements for those local businesses as well. Um, and those were, um, went through two meetings to get that approved. Um, and they provided mock-ups for these. Um, we have basically are entering a one year test phase for these three signs to see how they work out in our town, but they're used in other towns as well. Um, and they were coordinated with the graphic designer who's responsible for the wayfinding system that's already being installed in town. Um, and then those also come with um, um, several charging stations um, that could support people who used to use things like the library for charging phones or devices. Um, and that those will be installed around town as well. Um, and if we get out of our one year contract, uh, we will be able to keep these charging stations as a result. So we might lose the signage, but we'll be able to keep the charging station. So um, that was approved to let them go forward. We haven't approved the actual designs of the signs just yet. 
Um, they'll come back to that uh, later on, but we just wanted to give them a go ahead to start um, uh, applying and utilizing those funds for this purpose. Thank you. Uh, and the zoning subcommittee is again on hiatus. Uh, report of the chair. Janet has a question. Oh. Oh, Janet. Um, I wonder if we could add to the um, planning board committee and liaison reports a report on like what our sister committee, the CRC, is is working on. Like, because I know Chris, you go to those, and mm -hmm. I'm just I'm. I'm not saying for tonight, but like just to have a sense of what they're covering in their meetings so we have an idea what they're working on in terms mm -hmm. of priorities or the bylaw or, you know, whatever that really overlaps with us. I wonder if that's an idea that would be helpful. I think so. Yeah. I'd be happy to do that. And um, I can tell you just briefly that the meeting that they had on Tuesday, um, they discussed 40R for an hour. And they also looked at um, a chart or a matrix that's been developed by um, Ben Brager in our office to chart um, the different items that the planning board, planning department, and the CRC have said are their priorities for zoning changes. So um, the chart is an effort to get a handle on how long will it take to do various changes, whether we need consulting consultants on these changes um, and other information related to that. So um, that's all part of the CRC's packet um, and you could look at it online if you wanted to, so. Thank you, good su uh, suggestion, Janet. So uh, report of the chair, uh, I don't think I have anything more to add than what you know has been discussed here. So good, very good meeting. Uh, Board of staff, Chris. Thanks. We're all working really hard, the planning board as well as the planning department. So thanks for all your hard work. And so we can adjourn at 9.09.